Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. My name is Ian Rowlands and I'm the Associate Vice President International at the University of Waterloo, where I'm also a professor in the Faculty of Environment. I'm speaking to you, to, to you today from my home, which is along with the main campus of the University of Waterloo, located on the traditional Indigenous territory of Anishinaabe, Haudenosaunee, and Neutral peoples. More specifically, we're situated on the Haldeman Track, the land promised to the Six Nations that includes six miles on each side of the Grand River. At the University of Waterloo, our active work towards reconciliation with Indigenous peoples takes place across our campuses through research, learning, teaching, and community building. I'd like to welcome you to day two of the sixth annual Leading the Charge Conference. And today is a very special day because we'll be hearing from several of the world's leading university laboratories that are working in the clean energy space. From Brazil, from Singapore, from the United Kingdom, and from the United States. Hearing these international perspectives and the chance to interact with these globally renowned scientific leaders is so valuable as we all work to advance Canada's net zero emission goal and the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals more generally. Indeed, it's been my pleasure and privilege to be involved in scientific internationalization through the activities of the NSERC Energy Storage Technology Network during the past few years. With colleagues, and many of them are engaging at this conference as well, We've been inspired by discoveries and applications we've learned about while abroad. We've built meaningful collaborations that have led to new understandings. And we've given our students outstanding international and intercultural experiences through extended visits abroad. Two of the many things that the past 18 months have taught us, I believe, are firstly the interdependence of our planet, and secondly, the importance of international scientific and technological cooperation in order to advance the global good. I'm so pleased that we have such a wonderful schedule of speakers today as we get insights from around the world. Indeed, thank you to NSERC for the support and thank you to our host Ryerson University for the leadership in putting together and delivering such an outstanding program. And before we get to the heart of the program, let me just provide some logistical details. Please refer to your program and use it to chart your own global journey today. The first session is in plenary, as is the final one of today. And then in between the second and third sessions will feature two concurrent workshops, and you'll be able to choose which one to attend. And if you really wanted to attend both workshops in either the second or third sessions, Please, fear not. All sessions are being recorded and you'll be able to watch the one you missed at a later date. Note that there'll be breaks throughout the day and that the conference will conclude at approximately 2.45 p.m. Eastern time. And now a, a quick tour of your hop-in screen in front of you, if you will. There, there are a couple of tabs on the right of your screen and they're labeled session and event. The session tab is where you can pose questions within an individual session, like the one that we're all in right now. And there will be an opportunity to ask our speakers questions during each and every one of our sessions and use the Q&A uh, tab that you see under session right there. The event tab is where you can share your comments across the conference. And beyond that, if you're on Twitter, for example, you can use the hashtag leading the charge. If you have any technical issues or questions during the event, please head to the help desk located under the sessions tab on your left or email ltc at ryerson.ca. There are also booths available to visit throughout the day during the breaks and thank you to all of our partners for being here today. If you'd like to take advantage of the networking capabilities during this virtual conference, please note that you can request a meeting with other attendees via the people tab on the right hand side of your screen. Update your profile, let others know who you are and uh, have some very useful conversations. And we hope you have a very productive day as we have uh, go into the second day today. It now gives me great, great pleasure to introduce you to Jenny Young, 
who will introduce our keynote speaker. Jenny Young is the British Consul General in Toronto and Deputy Trade Commissioner in North America for the United Kingdom, entering that role just under a year ago now in July 2020. Jenny's on loan from Her Majesty's Treasury, where she ran the international team and budget. There, her responsibilities include traveling with the Chancellor to meetings of the World Bank, IMF, and G20. Jenny's previous experience includes the Prime Minister's delivery unit, postings in Japan and Europe, and Jenny's also worked in the non-governmental organization sector in the United Kingdom. Jenny has a degree in French and German from Cambridge University and is an operational Japanese speaker. Jenny, we're delighted that you've joined us this morning, and please let me now pass it over to you to introduce our keynote speaker. Thanks, Ian. That, that, that's very kind of you to introduce me. Of course, I'm actually here to introduce Professor Brandon. Really looking forward to his um, presentation today, so I will keep this as brief as I can. But first, I would just like to say good morning to everyone. I hope you've all enjoyed the first day of the Leading the Change Conference. And this conference is so timely um, for two particular reasons. First, tackling the climate crisis requires a truly global effort. The UK is hosting COP26 this year, which marks a really important milestone. A rapid and just transition to clean energy is vital to meet the goals of the Paris Agreement, and the transition offers immense opportunities for jobs and growth, sustainable environment, and improved public health. As we all know, it can also boost energy access, energy efficiency, and energy security. And secondly, we can only meet these really ambitious goals if we work together. And that's why I find this conference so exciting, because it brings together our globally leading innovators, academics and decision makers, such as Professor Brandon, who's about to speak to us. Um, it provides a forum for us to discuss how we want to use our joint strengths to accelerate the development and deployment of next generation clean technologies. The UK and Canada have a long history of collaboration in science and innovation. And since 2017, we've spent over 80 million pounds in joint project funding. And that has supported collaborative projects between UK and Canadian innovators across key sectors, which include clean, clean energy. And most recently, um, the British consulate here in Toronto hosted our first ever UK-Canada summit on solid state batteries. It brought together leading researchers, companies and funding agencies to see how we could work together to further solid state and other next generation battery technologies. But really, um, I'm here today um, and it's such a great pleasure to do this um, to introduce Professor Nigel Brandon from Imperial College London. Um, Professor Nigel Brandon is the Dean of the Faculty of Engineering at Imperial College London. His research is focused on electrochemical devices for energy applications with a particular focus on fuel cells, electrolyzers and batteries. Um, he's also the director of the UK Research and Innovation funded hydrogen and fuel cell Supergen hub a founder of Ceres Power and the chair of the Sustainable Gas Institute at Imperial College. He was awarded the Royal Academy of Engineering Silver Medal in 2007, the Institute of Civil Engineers Baker Medal in 2011, and the ASME Francis Bacon Medal in 2014 for his contribution to fuel cell science and engineering. So with that, I wish everyone a really enjoyable conference today. Really looking forward to working with all of you to further strengthen UK-Canada collaboration. Welcome again, Nigel. I would have loved to have met you here in Toronto, but I will be listening and learning, and I'm sure we're all gonna get a lot out of this virtual presentation today. Thank you, and over to you. Thanks, Jenny. I think I dive in from there, right? So thanks for the very kind introduction. I will just take a moment to get my screen shared for my presentation and hopefully, hopefully, uh, perhaps Jenny, you can tell me, can you see that? Okay, has that come up? 
Um, it's perfect. I think you, I can see your PowerPoint edging, so you might want to just hit full screen, yeah, but that's if nice. that's difficult, I can see perfectly well mm -hmm. enough. There we go. That should do. There we, there we go. That should now be, should be right on. Okay. Thanks, Jenny. Uh, and thanks for the other, uh, the introduction. So, yes, it's a pleasure to be virtually here. It would, of course, be much nicer to be actually with you. And I've always and very much enjoyed my opportunities to visit Canada. Of course, Canada is well known for its uh, expertise in electrochemical technologies um, and um, including the, some of those that I'm going to be <laughs> have the pleasure about talking to you about today. Um, so, yes, I, as, uh, I, I, as Jenny kind of mentioned, I'm uh, director of the Hydrogen and Fuel Cell Supergen Programme in the UK and chair of our Imperial College Sustainable Gas Institute. And I'll provide some links at the end um, to those should anyone want to find out any more details. So for my uh, talk um, this morning, your time this afternoon, my time, uh, I, want to, I want to start off by spending a little bit of time about uh, reflecting on, on why and where do we need energy storage. Uh, I'm going to concentrate on grid applications for energy storage, so I'm not going to be talking about batteries for vehicles, but much more around the uh, opportunities for energy storage in reinforcing low carbon uh, energy systems. Um, having spent some time thinking about that, um, it, which is effectively somewhat technology agnostic, but sets the sets the sets the case. Uh, I want to talk about two specific uh, pieces of technology I've been involved in, um, uh, and uh, perhaps give you a sense of that. Uh, one is, uh, and both are storage related and to a reasonable extent. The first is to think about longer term energy storage using hydrogen, and some of the technologies around that. Uh, and talk specifically about uh, a UK company that we set up 20 years ago, Ceres Power, which is, uh, I checked the share price this morning, is worth about three and a half billion Canadian dollars today. Uh, and uh, give you, uh, happy to take any questions on the experience of, of taking a, con a university spin out out to a three, and three, three billion dollar company, um, which is very clearly uh, only partly my doing. There have been many, many people involved in that journey. Uh, and then secondly, talk about um, fl a flow battery technology, which is linked to hydrogen, actually, because we use hydrogen as one of the storage loops. This is a much more nascent company, currently has six employees, and has just completed a seed funding round, and that's called RFC Power. So I'll try and give you a flavor of, of, uh, of what, what those organizations and companies are doing. Uh, and if you're interested uh, in any Q&A section, also I'm very happy to talk about the processes and, and opportunities and challenges of taking academic research out and uh, commercializing it in this space. Um, and then I'd like to close, um, certainly in preparing for this talk, I was asked to think, give some reflections on, on kind of the future. And I've chosen to do that really with some thoughts um, around opportunities and challenges for this space going forward. So that's, that's what my intent is. Um, now, unfortunately, because of the way uh, my screen is set up. I can't see any questions or anything that come up during my presentation. I can only see my slides. So if you have questions, do feel send them in, but we'll we'll deal with them at the end. So let's think about the the purpose and value of energy storage to energy systems. Um, and unashamedly, I'm going to take a UK context here because it's where I'm based. It's, it's where I'm most familiar with the analysis. Uh, but there will be some common learnings here. So please do reflect on your own uh, national situations, whether that's in Canada or elsewhere, and think about what um, lessons or messages from this you can take in, into your own uh, context. So this is some data very helpfully um, pulled together by uh, my, my colleague Grant Wilson at the University of Birmingham. Grant and his team do a great job in pulling together this sort of uh, high-level data. Um, and it's a map of uh, energy flows through the UK energy system. And in the vertical axis here, we have gigawatt hours per day flowing through the system. And we have it being, uh, as a function of time, for three main energy carriers. Um, and the red line at the bottom here is the flow of energy is electricity. And of course, we, we are making very good progress about decarbonizing that energy flow. And of course, we are interested in using those decarbonized electrons to then decarbonize other parts of the economy. Uh, but I mean, the first thing to take from this is that this is actually the smallest flow of energy through at least the UK energy system. 
Um, and that these little squiggles that you see in here, which are really do matter because for electricity, we absolutely have to balance the supply and demand of electrons second by second, minute by minute, hour by hour, day by day, and so on. Um, but just think about the other flows through the system as well, which sets, I think, some of the challenge. The re relatively horizontal line in, in gray here is the flow of fossil fuels as diesel and gasoline. So these are transportation fuels. Interesting to see the fall in that associated with going into lockdown in the UK in early 2020, but pretty much otherwise a fairly flat profile, largely seasonally independent. And of course, we are interested in moving from uh, diesel and gasoline into alternative fuels, or, um, battery electric being one of those, hydrogen fuel cell electric perhaps being another. Now, an electric car, for example, a battery electric car is a lot more efficient than an internal combustion engine car. Uh, we can see we have about 1600 gigawatt hours of energy flowing through as fossil liquid liquid fossil fuels at the moment that might drop down to more like 400 uh, uh, gigawatt hours of additional electricity to power that vehicle because it's just such a more efficient uh, uh, system and we currently have about 800 gigawatt hours per day flowing through as electricity so to meet that demand we probably need to put in about 50 percent more generating capacity to meet our transport fuel demand. Of course, that creates some local challenges in terms of how we uh, manage the flow of that additional electrical power through the uh, high voltage system and the low voltage system and send it out to where vehicles are going to be charged. And there are clearly important perturbations on the grid around that. <clears throat> and then the other line to draw your attention to is this blue line. This is the flow of natural gas through the UK energy system, uh, mostly uh, for heat, uh, but also, of course, for, for power generation. <clears throat> and the seasonality of this demand with a, a summer low when we need less heat and a winter peak <clears throat> when we need more heat is very evident. And how we decarbonize natural gas uh, and uh, or move away from un unabated natural gas into alternative forms of providing the energy for heating and for other applications is actually a really serious and, and, and significant challenge. Uh, particularly managing this seasonality. Now there is interest, for example, in using uh, more heat pumps rather than uh, gas boilers. Most, most British buildings are heated by burning natural gas and pumping the resultant hot water around the building and through radiators. Um, if we use a heat pump, then that might have a coefficient of performance of somewhere between three and four. That means that in, in the winter, uh, probably we need about one unit of electricity to make three units of heat. And in the summer, we probably need about one unit of electricity to make four units of heat. Heat pumps work better in the summer than the winter, somewhat counterintuitively, but that's how it is, at least in the British climate. Um, but that drives significant extra peak load. Uh, we're seeing here peaks of up to about, say, 4,000 gigawatt hours, even with a coefficient of performance of four, uh, let's, well, even, let's say, three. That's an extra 1,300 gigawatt hours. So you can see that by, we've got 1,300 extra here. We've got another 400 extra here. That's 1,700 extra gigawatt hours on top of the 800. So it's a significant increase in our electricity flow and a significant increase in the peak electricity demand. Uh, you can see, for example, uh, shown here is what is colloquially known as the beast from the east. I shouldn't say this to a Canadian audience, but this was a for the UK, a fairly sharp drop in temperatures down to a three week period where the temperature didn't rise much above minus 10, which for us is definitely colder than usual and you can see the impact on uh, peak gas demand that flowed from that and we have to build a system that will accommodate these peaks we have to build a system that will accommodate this seasonal variability in uh, energy flows uh, and we have to accommodate one that will manage as i say across a range of time frames and it's that that provides the challenge and the opportunity for uh, energy storage uh, which is the topic of my talk today so having said that, let's look at some specific examples. I'm, I'm grateful to my colleague, uh, Goran Strabak, with whom I have quite a number of collaborations. Goran's a colleague in, in electrical engineering, working on power system modeling and economics. Uh, and several of the slides I'm going to show now come from this paper that we, we published, which Goran led, but we, we jointly published in Progress in Energy fairly recently, if anyone's interested in looking it up. And this first piece of work says, well, uh, it's very likely in the UK context that most of our additional renewable electricity capacity will come from wind. 
mostly offshore wind. The UK is a relatively crowded little island, but it's a very windy one. And so we actually have some of the best wind resource in Europe blowing in off the Atlantic and harvesting all of that wind energy. Um, and if we, if we uh, put in a, the additional wind capacity, this plot shows the um, uh, increasing, uh, as a function of the increase in wind capacity here, what the wind curtailment would need to be if we didn't change the way in which we manage and balance the supply of energy with the demand for energy. And you can see as we put in, for example, 30 gigawatts of wind capacity, which is about a 50% increase, it's a step in the right direction, but as we've just been discussing, we might need a lot more than that. Uh, nonetheless, if we don't think about how we run the system, we would need to curtail about 25% of that uh, additional output. And that starts to get quite an expensive way of uh, installing capacity into the system. So a key trend here and a key theme of this talk is the need for flexibility. Uh, technologies that deliver flexibility to the system that shift and control the supply of uh, air energy generation or consumption to maintain the system security at the lowest possible cost. Uh, and hence technologies that deliver flexibility as we move to increasingly low carbon systems in which we have increasing amounts of intermittent renewable penetration will start to generate increasing value. Um, again, this is another piece of work from this paper led by Goran's team looking at the asset utilization as we move ahead in time. Uh, and as we move ahead in time by increasingly decarbonizing our energy system by increasing renewables penetration. Uh, again, if we have a system that's not flexible, that can't time shift supply and demand, we end up putting in more and more uh, infrastructure, which we use less and less of the time. In other words, we have to manage the peaks by building in uh, plants and putting in cables and wires, um, but we can't use that much of the time, or we put in peak a plant, and again, we can't use it much of the time. So the asset utilization factor goes down, and again, that becomes a big cost driver. Um, so we've done quite a bit of work uh, at Imperial College for the Committee on Climate Change in the UK. The Committee on Climate Change are a, a body that, that, well, actually is a legally binding body that um, advises government on our, our carbon strategies and our, our carbon um, targets and opportunities. Um, and this is some work looking at the savings in annualised GB system costs. So again, it's a, it's a UK example, a GB example, but I think one can read it into other cases uh, in billions of pounds a year. Okay, so again, it's in it's uh, it, it's in pounds. We multiply by about one point seven to get to Canadian dollars, I believe, at the moment. Um, and it looks at a range of scenarios for the UK. The 100 grams here refers to a grid electricity target of 100 grams of CO2 per kilowatt hour, and the 50 refers to 50 grams of CO2 per kilowatt hour, whether it's reliant on high photovoltaic penetration or high wind penetration does make a little bit of difference, but not that much. Um, and then we, it, it looks at the extra costs that would be incurred, which are below this naught line here, which is um, some capex associated with demand uh, side management and demand reduction and some associated with storage capex and then the opportunities for savings associated with things like reduced operating costs so reduced fuel costs elsewhere in the system uh, reduced uh, capex distribution system capex reduced uh, interconnection capex not, not a lot of that in these particular cases um, uh, reduced capex in, in generating support, generation support and importantly and most significantly reduced capex in low carbon generation because we need to put in a smaller peak because we can time shift supply and demand we can actually get away with building less low carbon generation. Now the economics depend on the assumptions you have for future prices of wind and solar and so on but in this particular uh, set of scenarios which were based on UK government uh, projections on some of these costs you can start to see that we project significant savings um, by having technologies available which deliver flexibility to the system. Um, and so here we have 7.8 billion pounds a year forecast saving in terms of delivering a 50 gram CO2, uh, 50 gram CO2 per kilowatt hour uh, electricity system, whether that's based on PV or whether it's based on wind. And that's effectively the size of the prize, the value proposition that flexi flexibility brings to the system. 
Now, there are lots of interesting questions about how markets recognize that value, how regulators uh, allow uh, profits to be taken from operators from that value, and those all matter. But this is taking the UK PLC um, perspective um, rather than trying to think about markets and regulations that allow uh, owners to um, and uh, companies to access that value stream. That's, of course, very important, but this is the starting point. Um, another way of looking at this is what does this mean for energy storage? Because energy storage is only one type of flexible technology. There are certainly other solutions on the table and we mustn't discount those. Interconnection, for example, for the UK is, is, is an option. We are an island off, off, off mainland Europe and so greater interconnections across to Ireland and across to mainland Europe are clearly one way of delivering some flexibility. Uh, more flexible generation is another way of delivering flexibility. And demand side management is another way of delivering flexibility. But here we look at the storage opportunity. And what this particular figure here says uh, on this axis is the units of storage capacity. So that's units of power essentially in pounds per kilowatt. Um, and uh, on this vertical, uh, this horizontal axis here is gigawatts. Uh, and if we took a particular uh, price point, so let's say we had storage available to £1,000 a kilowatt in terms of its uh, capacity. Um, and we look across different time frames because we're going to need different types of storage as we increasingly decarbonize. These dates effectively relate to decarbonization targets. Um, you can see that as we go more and more uh, into deeper and deeper carbon uh, cuts so 2050 would in this calculation which was done a couple of years ago is an 80 percent co2 cut 2030 is a 50 percent co2 cut now we have a net zero target is 100 percent co2 cut that would be in the uh, number even further out to the right we can see with that price of storage we might build to, uh, say around um, 15 gigawatts of storage capacity in, in this scenario and out to 2050 25 gigawatts and if our storage costs go up we build less, but when we look out at this 2050 scenario, if you see even at really high storage costs, of 5,000 pounds a kilowatt. So, if that's a uh, you know a, a four-hour energy storage unit, that's 1,250 pounds, so 2,000 dollars a kilowatt hour. We're still rationally building uh, nearly 10 gigawatts of that capacity as the way to manage that system. And that tells you the size of the opportunity and also just how challenging it is to manage very high uh, renewable penetration into electrical energy systems. If we start to look at how that propagates over time, we can start to get a sense of the uh, amount we'd install and the value of it, uh, or at least the benefits of it, which gives you a, uh, a budget for that uh, investment, and those budgets become very significant. Uh, you also see that as we go forward, that the, the uh, effectively the incremental um, cost of that storage needs to fall. And this makes sense because the first storage installations will capture the most value. And as we go down and out, greater installation uh, amounts, the, the value that can be captured does go down, but it, it's still material and it's still significant. Um, I think so as well as the value, I think the other point to take from here is that different technologies or the, the technology readiness of different flexibility options will influence the type of system we end up building. Um, this is a, a piece of work from the same type of analysis looking at installed capacity. This is the, uh, a piece of work which says what's the, what's the uh, lowest overall cost of achieving a carbon target uh, in terms of grams of CO2 per kilowatt hour uh, based on a set of assumptions that we were given by um, the government around the co future cost of technology depending on whether the system had low flexibility or high flexibility. Both systems will deliver the same carbon target, but they look very different. In a low flexibility system, you put in a lot of nuclear, backed up by some, fair lot, some open cycle gas turbine uh, and um, some conventional gas. In a high flexibility system, you get a small amount of nuclear, but you get a very large amount of wind and a very large amount of solar. Um, you could argue, so both deliver you the same carbon target, but they look very different and they feel very different. I think the other point to note from this is that um, in terms of the cost, this system on the right is about three to four billion pounds cheaper, to year to, cheaper per year to build than the system on the left. 
Of course, that cost difference is very much based on the cost difference between nuclear and wind and solar technologies. But I think it's fair to say that wind and solar technologies continue to get cheaper and nuclear does not. So since this analysis was done, I think this is probably an even more marked uh, difference. And if we look at the 50 grams of CO2 uh, per kilowatt hour target, we get the same story. But now the cost differential is between seven and eight billion pounds a year cheaper for the uh, system on the high flexibility system than the, the low flexibility system on the left. So that's the value opportunity of, uh, of technologies that deliver flexibility to future low carbon uh, systems. Now, what sort of role can energy storage play um, when we start to look at the detail? And this is a figure actually taken from uh, some work we did a, a few years ago. Um, and it's, uh, you know, it, it's, it's, it paints a, you know, quite a, a well-considered and, and widely regarded view. So you've got uh, storage power requirements on the horizontal axis. You've got storage time uh, uh, up, up on the vertical axis. Um, and um, uh, so we need a combination of different power ratings and different time settings, whether this is in the milliseconds range for power system reliability and quality, or whether it's up into the hours range for um, uh, reserve and arbitrage. The applications I want to talk about today are very much in this top right hand corner where we're looking into the hours and even days of energy storage. Um, and when we start to look at those technologies, which are both electrochemical in nature, we shouldn't forget that just because they can do hours does not mean that they can't do minutes and seconds. So for the right technologies can actually play across the range of landscapes of energy store of services that are provided to electricity systems. And with the right market mechanisms in place, uh, it allows owners of those assets to capture value from different, from a range of de delivering a range of different services into uh, low carbon grids. Um, the first, uh, case then I want to specifically talk about is the, the question of backing up solar photovoltaics. Um, this uh, very interesting report from the um, Californian Energy Storage Alliance from late 2020 looks at what's needed to deliver a 100% renewable uh, power system in California um, by 2045. Uh, and because of the high penetration of solar photovoltaics in California that's likely to deliver that target, um, the report concludes that a, a, around a 10 hour energy storage technology or, or technologies that deliver you about 10 hours of energy storage are going to be uh, very much more important going forward uh, than they are today. We haven't, today we don't there's not that many examples of where we need 10 hours of energy storage. We certainly need minutes and we might need an hour or two, um, but we certainly rarely need 10. But if we start to look out to the future, then technologies that deliver that sort of range of tobacco, sort of overnight storage of photovoltaics, start to become increasingly dominant. And this is something for us to have in mind or start to become increasingly significant uh, as a proportion of the uh, energy storage. Uh, technology options. So it's a very interesting conclusion from this particular piece of work and I think relevant to anywhere where high PV penetration is important. Perhaps slightly less the case in the UK where it's much more likely to be wind um, but um, in many parts of the world uh, an important observation. What in the UK case I think is uh, particularly important um, and for other countries that are going into high wind generation is what happens for those periods of the year when the wind stops blowing. Certainly in Northern Europe, it's well known that in the winter, of course, the time at which we need our electricity supply the greatest, particularly if we're backing up heat with it, um, we, get a, we often get a low in the wind uh, flows and therefore a, a, a reduction in the amount of wind energy that we're generating. Again, this is some work from my, led by my colleague Goran Strabakin that features in this paper in Progress in Energy, if you want to look in a bit more detail, and the reports that underpin that. Um, and it looks at the opportunities to use hydrogen uh, to deal with low wind uh, periods. And the units here are terawatt hours, so that's a, a, a very big unit. And even if we take, say, a two-week period with low wind, uh, which is uh, you know, not an unrealistic situation, 
you can see that we're needing somewhere approaching 20 terawatt hours of storage to balance that two week low wind period if we didn't, if we're reliant um, uh, without having any other form of backup uh, in the system. And we keep that number of 20 terawatts in mind because we're going to come back to it. Um, now, one of the ways you can provide uh, that you know, large scale energy storage is with pumped hydro. The UK does not have a lot of pumped hydro, but this is a photograph of Dunalwick, which is in Snowdonia in Wales. It's a pumped hydro station. Snowdonia is a national park, so an area of uh, natural beauty. And in fact, this is so-called electric mountain because the entire infrastructure associated with this pumped hydro station is actually put inside a mountain. Uh, there was a million cubic meters of rock excavated to build this and this particular facility came online uh, in the mid 80s and you get a sense of scale right this is a relatively large scale facility now de norwig will generate uh, provide seven hours of energy storage uh, if it's full there's a lower lake that this upper lake flows down into uh, and that stores 9.1 gigawatt hours of energy now if we just go back to this slide right um, uh, 9.1 gigawatt hours. Well, for two weeks of energy, we need about 20 terawatt hours. So we need 2,000 of these to back up that two week period. Uh, and that gives you a sense of the scale of the challenge. Right? We, we certainly don't have now 2,000 places in the UK to put this, let alone the cost of so doing. Um, so this is it's this type of analysis, the analysis from California and these reflections on these kind of strategic longer term requirements for backing up wind that's, that lead uh, people like Bloomberg New Energy Finance to start to conclude in reports like this that whilst the, uh, the nearer term market and the, and went at the date of this report, which is a 2019 report, uh, which looked at 2018 therefore, uh, you know, was mostly short duration. That's, you know, an hour or two uh, use cases with, a, with about eight gigawatt hours of, to worth about $5 billion. But to, to look out to 2040 or so to make this a 10 times larger market approaches $60 billion, 380 gigawatt hours deployed and about 50% long duration. So that's more than about four hours of energy storage. So it's a really interesting area and one that's, I think, ripe for some innovation. So I want to talk now about um, what that means. I want to talk about a couple of, a couple of examples uh, in terms of my own involvement in technology. And I, I want to kick off with this work with Ceres Power. Uh, and Ceres is a, hyd is a fuel cell and electrolyzer player making high temperature electrolyzers. And so this brings in hydrogen. I'm, I'm not going to talk about hydrogen more widely. I know you've already had talks on hydrogen at the event at the conference, but it's this piece around the role of hydrogen storage that I'm most, most interested in. And particularly these longer term storage opportunities. And this really brings in things like underground uh, hydrogen storage. I don't think it's credible cost effectively to think about overground hydrogen storage at the scale. Um, and so this is thinking about putting hydrogen into solution mine salt caverns. At the first glance, that might sound a bit uh, far-fetched, but actually we store natural gas today in solution mine salt caverns. And indeed we store hydrogen in solution mine salt caverns for very different reasons, mostly supporting chemical plants and oil refineries, which are the major users of hydrogen uh, as, as part of their uh, processing. And indeed the largest uh, single hydrogen store in the, in, in the US holds 100 gigawatt hours of hydrogen. So that's uh, 0.1 terawatt hours. So it, it's, uh, it's got, um, that, that's the equivalent of, of 10 of those Dinorwigs um, uh, under the ground. Um, and this is uh, taken from a paper from the International Journal of Hydrogen Energy, which came out last year. And it's a piece of analysis from a German group. And it's, it does a nice piece of analysis. Okay, this is now just looking at Europe. And it looks at the capacity for tav cavern storage capacity for hydrogen. So these are these underground solution line caverns, which are relatively affordable to build. Um, you're not tunneling uh, in, like you are in a hard rock, you're, you're solution mining in, in the salt dome. Uh, and it starts to explore. And, and from a UK context, that means that onshore and near shore hydrogen storage, because some of our salt deposits do move off the, the coast to some extent, is, is over a thousand terawatt hours. And again, if I flip back to this figure here, 
a thousand terawatt hours and we, and we need 20 terawatt hours. So whilst the scale of this technology doesn't map on, we need 2000 of them, we, can, we have more than enough capacity to deliver these, these weeks of storage with, um, with hydrogen, if that's what we choose to do. So that starts to bring in technologies like electrolyzers, how we make the hydrogen matters, and there are a range of different electrolysis technologies uh, highlighted here. Uh, and the one I'm thinking, uh, referring to is this high temperature electrolysis. It's the least mature, it's a steam electrolyzer. Um, and uh, when we start to look at uh, electrolysis and we start to think about the cost of hydrogen, this is some useful report from Irina looking at the future costs of, of making hydrogen. It's very sensitive to the renewable price, uh, but perhaps that's a conversation for Q&A. Um, but high temperature electrolysis, which is this red line here, uh, red bar here, has, is by far and away the most efficient form of electrolysis. You can see you can get elect electrolyzer efficiencies, lower heating values of actually over 100% if you're not accounting for the heat that you're uh, putting into the reactor. Uh, but even if you are accounting for it, it's still well over 80, 85% electrical efficiencies, whereas the low temperature electrolyzers, which are far more mature and have many other positive characteristics, are always less efficient. And if we're starting to think about, therefore, the round trip efficiency of using hydrogen as our energy store, we can see that perhaps if we use a high temperature electrolyzer, we might get to 90% uh, efficiency in making our hydrogen. And if we put that hydrogen into a fuel cell at about 60% efficiency, then we might get 50% overall round trip efficiency. And that's worth remembering. Um, about half the energy comes back out once we've made it and used it, stored it as hydrogen and reused it. And there may still be very good reasons to do that along the reasons I've articulated for long-term energy storage. Um, but in a minute, we'll talk about some technologies which might be able to improve on that. Um, for those who are interested more in the science, then I just wanted to give you a slide. We do a lot of work on materials for this application in particular electrode materials that take us into improved high temperature electrolysis. It's a big theme in my group. Very happy to talk to anyone that's interested in that. And we do a lot of work on imaging and characterization, modeling and simulation of these types of materials. Now, some years ago, we, to come back to the sort of company side of this, we were involved, I was involved along with colleagues in uh, developing a new type of solid oxide uh, technology which uses a metal support onto which we put our ceramic coatings that are the part of these electrochemical devices uh, and this is where the technology is today it was taken into this company we spin out we set up uh, series power in the year 2000 and this is a sort of cartoon of the materials that are used to make these cells it has a ferritic steel support uh, it has an anode right this is where the um, if it's a fuel cell it's where you oxidize uh, oxidize the fuel. Um, you have an electrolyte, uh, which is an oxide ion conducting material, and then you have a cathode on the top of this. So this is a material set that gives you some very interesting characteristics. This is a photograph of a modern series power solid oxide cell with this stamped and formed stainless steel, a phritic stainless steel support onto which is put these ceramic coatings. And this is a photograph of, of what this is the, the research facility uh, that Ceres have. They're building a factory at the moment. This is another photograph of one of these cells. And if you're interested, you can go and watch the fully charged video on the, put out by Robert Llewellyn Smith, which is on, uh, you can go and view online. And they, they did a feature on this particular company. Okay, and the company's making great progress and it's got a range of commercial partnerships now with, with organizations looking at the fuel cell side. And they've recently announced that they're getting involved into the electrolyzer side. They've just raised about 300 Canadian, 300 million Canadian dollars to extend their fuel cell work into high temperature electrolyzers. And I think that's part of the piece around long-term storage of hydrogen, because if you're gonna make hydrogen for energy storage, it's much better to do that with a 90% efficient electrolyzer than a 65% efficient electrolyzer. Okay. So in the time I've got left, I want to start to talk about um, float batteries, and I want to talk about hours of storage rather than days and weeks of storage. Um, and this is a, a cartoon of a, of a flow battery, which I shall use just to kind of explain some of the critical sort of main characteristics of the technology. Um, this particular 
image comes from this report that we, we issued a few years ago on UK research need for grid scale energy storage technologies. It's a sort of high level document aimed particularly at, um, at policymakers and funders of research uh, to paint a picture of the different technologies that uh, are of interest and where the UK at least has some skill set. One of those was in flow batteries and this picture uh, comes from that report. Um, shown on here is, is vanadium chemistry, which is the most widely used and the most mature uh, flow battery uh, chemistry, but we'll talk a little bit about other options as well. And uh, in brief, in a, in a flow battery, we have uh, a device in the middle here that is uh, much like a fuel cell or much like an electrolyzer. So in, in electrolyzer mode, we put in a chemical species on both sides of a ionically conducting membrane. Um, and we 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 uh, change the oxidation state of the redox couple in that membrane. So when we're charging our battery in this particular case, we put vanadium, a vanadium salt on both sides. Now vanadium is interesting in that it can have a number of different oxidation states. And in this particular case, we are, we we go from um, we produce we go from vanadium three to vanadium two when we're charging the battery. So we produce uh, a reduced form of our vanadium. And we go from vanadium four to vanadium five uh, on the other side of our battery when we're charging it. So that gives us an oxidized form. And then we can store our solution, which is now oxidized vanadium ions in our tank. And we can store our solution, which is now a reduced form of vanadium ions in our tank. And when we want to produce the electricity back, we want, to re we want the battery to discharge. We simply flow this reduced form and this oxidized form back into the reactor which now acts as a fuel cell and will regenerate the electricity. And typically these devices will have a round trip efficiency of about 80% or so. So we get out back out about 80% of the electricity we put in. Not as good as a lithium ion battery, but with a number of important advantages over a lithium ion battery, mainly that if we want to store more energy, we simply need a bigger tank. And so it, it, uh, we talk about decoupling power and energy. So the power of the device depends on the size of this central uh, power stack, if you like, that acts as a fuel cell or an electrolyzer. But the energy depends on the size of the tank. And that's very different to a uh, conventional battery like a lithium ion battery, where if you want 10 times more energy, you need 10 times more batteries. And so for longer storage periods, then this starts to give you some advantages because you're changing the scaling rules. Tanks are relatively cheap to scale. Obviously, you also need to put in more of the electrolyte, so it's sensitive to the price to the price of vanadium in this particular case. Uh, but it has a different cost profile to uh, sort of pr conventional primary or secondary batteries. Um, and so as I say, vanadium is the incumbent, but there are a range of other uh, technologies, a range of other chemistries that people are pursuing uh, around the world in terms of different flow battery options. The all vanadium, which is what I've put on the top here, is best definitely the best known. Um, if you do get vanadium inadvertently crossing this membrane, and because it's vanadium both sides, that, that means that that's less of a problem. When you have dissimilar chemical species, it's more of a challenge. But you are sensitive to the cost of vanadium. Vanadium is not uh, an it's, it's not a costly material, but neither is it a cheap material. And its cost is quite volatile. It's mainly pinned to the price of vanadium used by the steel making industry. You need some inert atmosphere and you also get parasitic hydrogen evolution, which is not only an inefficiency, but also has to be managed from a hazard perspective. But you can see from this figure on the right that there are many companies pursuing this and it's, it's definitely by far and away the most mature flow battery option today. Advanced vanadium essentially refers to some modifications to the electrolyte to give you slightly higher vanadium solubility, so you get slightly higher charge density, energy density. Um, all iron uh, is, uh, has been a bit of a flagship of late. Uh, this company, ESS, has um, just become the world's first one billion valued flow battery business. Um, and, and, is, and it's an interesting area, but I, I don't see that the all iron chemistry is free of risk. And indeed, things like dendrite formation uh, are, are a challenge. Um, hydrogen bromine, uh, pioneered by company Elastor, uh, uses hydrogen on one side, bromine on the other. Bromine is not a particularly safe material, so I think it takes you into regimes of where you need to be careful where you put such a, a flow battery, but you know, making good progress. Zinc bromide is, is a variant of this, but now we use a solid zinc uh, in, uh, instead of hydrogen on the one electrode. 
um, and you electro deposit zinc. Well, everyone who's tried to do that will know that zinc dendrites are a challenge and, and how you manage that. And you've got the bromine issue. Uh, zinc air is another variant on this. Again, you've got the dendrites, and again, you've got some challenges with the reversibility of the air electrode. And organic redox couple uh, redox batteries again are of uh, are interest. Uh, the question is, can you bring them through with the right stability and lifetime? So all of these are on, uh, being under development, and all of them are being pursued. Um, we have a different approach to that, and obviously, we would take the view that our approach is robust and brings benefit. And we will tell you a little bit about it in a moment. We, we set a spin-out company up in 2017 called RFC Power. Uh, it's, uh, it's a collaboration um, between the uh, chemistry and engineering, and my colleague, Professor Anthony Kusinak, is uh, co-founder and, and director, uh, along with myself and a former uh, postdoc from my group, Vladimir Ufit. Um, and then we have uh, a growing team. We've got six full-time staff at the moment and a full-time CEO, Tim Von Werner, who's got a background in, in innovation and building uh, uh, technology companies. And it came out of about 10 years, again, uh, for science at the university into liquid gas flow batteries. So this is a liquid gas approach uh, with hydrogen as one of the couples. Uh, so it plays and links into the conversation we've just had around hydrogen. And we have a new innovation campus at Imperial College, which is based to the west of London, and the, you know, the, the um, company is located there and has just closed a seed funding round, primarily with IP Group. Um, so again, whenever you're trying to take technology out of a university, and uh, you do need to make certain you have a very strong and robust IP position, um, because it's a long journey to go from where you are to where you need to be to have a commercial proposition, always. Um, and indeed, th th we, this is no exception. We have uh, patents around the use of hydrogen gas as one of our storage media, coupled in a closed loop, coupled with an, a range of different metal species, vanadium, cerium, or manganese. And it's manganese, in fact, that's proven to be our front runner and the one we're, we're most actively pursuing. Uh, we have another patent around how you stabilize that electrolyte because normally you can't use manganese. And so we have a patent on the use of titanium as a titanium as a stabilizing agent and we have a patent on a way of regenerating that electrolyte should we get any capacity fade which is nice and simple and quick and easy to do we also have a patent on a different type of chemistry which is not acidic this is an acidic chemistry but uses an alkaline chemistry in this case based on the use of polysulfide solutions which you produce by dissolving sulfur in sodium hydroxide and coupling that with a reversible air electrode this is the cheapest possible chemistry you could envisage, um, but still needs to have more development on the membrane and electrodes before we have a, a, a practical device that at least we have one that works, but we don't have one that works well enough to consider upscaling it. And we also have a, a patent on organic hydrogen. So this takes combines a, an organic couple with hydrogen. So we're really covering the landscape in terms of liquid gas flow battery uh, technologies within the company. So this is a, a slightly old slide, but it's, it's helpful for, for a couple of reasons. Excuse the quality of the image on the right there. Um, but here we have now our redox couple, which in this case is a liquid on the uh, on one side, which is the manganese titanium based electrolyte, and then a closed hydrogen loop on the other side. Um, manganese is attractive to use uh, for this redox couple. It's the fourth most abundant, uh, fourth, fourth most used metal after iron, aluminium and copper, so it's produced in very large uh, tonnages. Uh, unlike vanadium, which is primarily found in China and Russia, uh, manganese is much more abundant in, in different parts of the world. Um, the use of hydrogen and uh, a liquid and gas means that if we did get any crossover, it's easy to recover. You can re-inject any liquid crossover back into the liquid side very easily. You still get the decoupling of power and energy uh, and hydrogen is a very facile reaction, which means you get high power density. Uh, we were pleased to be a finalist in the Shell New Energy Challenge last year, though we were not so pleased to not win, but we, we did come second. Um, this is the chemistry in a little bit more detail. So a manganese uh, shifting between manganese 2 and manganese 3 on the cathode side, and protons and hydrogen on the anode side. So if we're charging our battery, we're going to make hydrogen effectively in electrolyzer mode. 
uh, and we're going to produce our manganese two, and then we're going to recombine those together. Um, sorry, we're going to make manganese three, and then we're going to recombine those together when we discharge the battery uh, and effectively run in fuel cell mode with the manganese three as the oxidant and the hydrogen as the uh, reductant. So that's how that um, comes comes together. So the hydrogen is the fuel and the uh, the manganese is the oxidant. So th therefore we get, an, we get an overall cell voltage of 1.49 volts and indeed this is a paper we produced on this chemistry uh, and if anyone's interested in looking it up there's quite a bit of background information on the actual chemistry. And you can see you can get very high power densities here over a watt per square centimetre is achievable uh, with a modest platinum loading. So this does have a platinum based catalyst on the hydrogen side in a sense, it's a fuel cell, acts like a fuel cell electrolyzer on the hydrogen side, and a conventional sort of porous carbon on the manganese side. Where is the technology in terms of the company? Uh, as always, when you're trying to take uh, university research forward, it's, it becomes much more about the technology. This figure on the left here shows uh, some single cell testing within the company at RFC Power. Um, the curves here, if you're struggling to read them, a capacity in blue at the top, a coulombic efficiency in the dark red, and then voltage efficiency in the gray, and energy efficiency in the amber. Um, we get round trip efficiencies, which is essentially the energy efficiency of around 80%. So that's, that's good. There's room to improve that going forward, I think, up to about 85%. Um, this is across seven, just over 700 full charge discharge cycles, so no capacity fade. We got a little bit of capacity fade at the end due to some test rig issues but we were able to recover that through our in-situ regeneration process. So 700 full, 100 to 0%, 100 state of charge, 100% state of charge to 0% state of charge cycles without any substantive, without capacity loss, good overall um, columbic and voltage efficiency and no electrolyte crossover. And then these are our own calculations. So you treat them as you will in terms of um, costs but we've done quite a, a detailed set of cost calculations looking at where we might get to in terms of the installed cost for this system. This is a particular calculation here is based on a one megawatt system storing increasing amounts of energy so this would be a one megawatt 10 megawatt hour system here and comparing it to lithium ion prices and you can draw your own line on lithium ion depending on your view of the world um, but they don't scale essentially they are a flat line uh, and you can see that depending on where you put your lithium ion price and lithium ion cost, uh, flow batteries go through uh, a, a tipping point, if you like. It becomes cheaper to use a flow battery once you get over about somewhere between four hours of energy storage, depending on your assumptions about relative price points. And certainly once you're at about 10 hours of storage, we're below $100 a kilowatt hour. And if you wanted to move out to 24 hours of storage, we're, we're touching $50 a kilowatt hour based on these um, these assumptions on, on production volumes and so on. So this is the vision of, of what RFC are doing, uh, a long lifetime deep discharge capable uh, battery based on this hydrogen manganese couple. And if a hydrogen economy does take off, then you can actually integrate this really nicely in with other hydrogen loops. And instead of having a reversible fuel cell electrolyzer running at about perhaps 60% efficiency max, for an energy storage application, you can have a flow battery coupled into that hydrogen loop running at 80 to 85 percent efficiency. So that's uh, that's that. I'll just close then with um, some comments on future opportunities and challenges. Um, I hope I've made the point that flexible and efficient technologies that shift between green electrons and green molecules are important. They're going to become increasingly important. As such, the value of flexibility will increase. Though as I've highlighted briefly and touched on, regulations and market mechanisms need to be in place to allow that to be captured. Energy storage is one means of providing that flexibility. Whilst I focused on longer term energy storage, we're going to need a range of storage solutions that serve different timescales, seconds, minutes, hours, days and weeks. So there's room for plenty and need for plenty of, of solutions. At least in my mind, I think lithium and perhaps sodium ion batteries are really the, the, the go-to solutions for perhaps up to four hours or so of energy storage. There are different flavours of those, of course. Probably hydrogen could be ammonia for days to weeks of storage, but we're in a much more open space for innovation in the four to 24 hour range. Obviously, we believe flow batteries are ideal in that space. 
Um, and certainly others are starting to get increasingly interested in the options that flow batteries provide. Our own view and our own approach is to develop a hybrid approach using a low cost, safe and abundant manganese coupled with a hydrogen loop at relatively low pressures, just a few bar. Of course, there are room, there's room to innovate around membranes, electrodes, stack and system designs, and we look forward to continuing to do that along with others. But regardless of the chemistry, regardless of the flow battery chemistry, we need to scale the technologies up. And we need the equivalent of a gigascale for processing for, for all of these um, flow battery and indeed other electrochemical options if they're to deliver on their promise of low cost, long term energy storage with good cycle life and good discharge capability and good rent trip efficiency. Um, for those interested in taking technologies out of universities, uh, I would say that it's a fascinating, challenging, time consuming, intellectually rewarding activity. And you might make some money if you're lucky. Um, so, but it's a fascinating thing to do. Um, also that if you do have a company, and RFC Power is a good example, RFC are not going to develop products that sell at, at, at a megawatt scale to business partners. It's going to need to partner with larger companies to deliver products to market. Um, it's just not credible for that not to, for that not to be the case. So supply balance of plant components, subsystems, volume manufacturing, product installation and maintenance. So this is a partnership ultimately, and certainly Ceres have found that through their partnership model, and I think it's very much the case here as well. Of course, funding's needed to help de-risk these technologies. If they're not available, we won't build a system that can use them. And I think that was the point made in some of the earlier slides. So we have to have technologies that are fit for in, ready for investment if we're going to build the uh, system that many people would like us to put together to deliver our carbon targets. And of course, we need people. We need talented and motivated people. And indeed, for those of us involved in university programs, a better development around and, and broadcasting and opportunities for training in electrochemical technologies is important as well. Uh, I'll, I'll put up these links uh, to anyone that's interested in trying to find out a bit more information on the companies, the Gas Institute, the Fuel Cell Hub, uh, and so on. And feel free to reach out. And I'll, I'll stop there. Nigel, thank you very much. Thank you very much for a wonderful presentation as you gave us a tour de force across the, the system as a whole, the importance of flexibility, the multiple pathways, and the deeper dialogue experiences as well. Um, we, we've got just a very little bit of time. Nigel, I'm not sure if you can see the Q&A now, but we've got a question that's asking about flow batteries, current success using yep. organic materials. So I'm wondering if you have a quick reaction to that before I wrap up. Yeah, I mean, I think I think organic is a really interesting opportunity, um, and and the, the question's right. It obviously takes you away from um, th the issues around um, both mining operations and um, and some of the geopolitics. The question is, can you deliver a cost-effective solution that's got you th that has the right lifetime with on, with an organic solution? So it's we're working on them. Other people are working on them. I don't think they're at the level of they're not at the same stage of maturity yet. Um, I mean, I'd say that manganese is interesting. Of course, you mine it, but you know, every dry cell, every uh, every battery that you've got, every primary battery that you've got in your home has manganese in it. So it's it's a widely produced material for primary batteries for consumer applications. So it's it's, it's extensively used. That's not to say, of course, we shouldn't pay attention to the circularity of that economy. Um, but it's it's a matter of getting the organic ones. Uh, to the right technology maturity. They're often su susceptible to air, air contamination and all sorts of things. So they're, they're not as an easy thing to use. Great. Thank you for that, Nigel. And once again, thank you very much for a wonderful presentation. If, if you were with us in Toronto, we'd all be applauding right now. So I hope through the yep. Atlantic, thank you can uh, feel the positive energy and so on. So thank, thank you. you for a wonderful presentation and uh, sharing your insights with us. And uh, to the participants as a whole, let me say, please join us for the next session, which will be at 1015 Eastern time. And at that point, you'll have a couple of choices to go to on the sessions tab on the left hand side of the screen. Um, Hoe Bing Gui from Nanyang Technological University in Singapore will be presenting, as well as Walmir Fritas from the University of Campinas in Brazil will be presenting. And during those 10 minutes, you can, uh, of course, visit virtual booths 
and uh, use the networking features that have, are available in Hopin as well. But uh, as a reminder, you've got uh, about uh, just under 10 minutes now. At 10.15 Eastern time, we'll be reconvening in our concurrent sessions. Thank you very much, everyone. Goodbye.